What do we see as typical science lessons? There's a few people in this room that, that are about my age. Uh, and uh, Jean, how are you? <laughs> uh, we're looking at what we used to have back in uh, 60s, 70s, even beforehand. Science was really about this notion of information transfer. So science teaching became something that, that we would have this sense of having textbooks, lots of information. We would do cookbook labs. We would have to get those. Uh, get the right answer and again we would test it about our memory how well we could do something could we give back the right answers and since you're all sitting in here that means that you are some of the people that could give back the right answers that that's why you're here um, if we go to university currently I would suggest that most of our undergraduate labs are fairly cookbook you've got a recipe get it and if you don't get the right one and give the right explanation then we're struggling with some of you know getting a good result on it so we've got science, school science, that, that really back then was a real push on, on, on the exactness of it. And it really came back, as a sense of this, came out of the 50s and 60s. And it, and it was driven in part by Sputnik in the sense that when that went up, the Cold War was pretty obviously very much alive and there was a big drive to make sure, for example, in the States, uh, that you wouldn't be left behind. And since the states was driving a lot of the Western European, you know, Western European thinking in terms of science. We then did that same in Australia. There was this big push to get lots of information, get people up to scratch so they could be, become part of that race. If we also think about what was learning back then, it was very much about behavioural learning. Some of you, uh, well, we've all experienced that, the sense of positive and negative reward structures, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And back then, unfortunately, we didn't have a focus on females. We tend to be a fairly, science was a fairly male dominated push in terms of schools. And the notion of getting more females into that is, is, has been a lot more current than it was back in the 60s. Uh, I don't know if some of you started, when my chemistry class, when I started at university, there were three females. And, and, you know, they, and they managed to get through, but in terms of male-female ratio, it was, it was pretty low. So if we think about what behavioural learning was and how that impacted upon what happened in schools, it, it's really important to think about where we're at now. When we look back then, it was a sense of positive and negative reinforcers. You got positive reinforcement if you got the right answer, you were crushed a little bit if you didn't get, the, if you didn't get that. Uh, we had a lot of curriculum that was based around that. Uh, some of you that are going through methods classes now, if you go back to the books from the 60s, you will see that there's a, a lot more information and it's not geared to the same way in which we do it now. Um, if you look at some of the early uh, stuff out of the 70s, it was what we call mastery learning. That is, you weren't allowed to proceed on to the next bit unless you could master the first bit. And there were some programs where the teacher actually had to sign off on before you could actually move on to the next bit. And that, that drove a lot of the curriculum. It, it also meant, as a start of that, um, in the 70s, we, we got into the notion of the stages of, of development that came around through Piaget. Uh, some of you may be familiar with his, some of his work, but it drove the science curriculum in the 70s. So we couldn't do good science in, in, at the young age because the young kids weren't ready to do that. They weren't cognitively developed, and therefore they weren't allowed to do that. So it, it had this. We can have some of that these days, on, that, that had impact on, on uh, student reading programs, for example. If you have a look at some of those, some of you may have come through that, where you had the box and you, you, could, you weren't allowed to go onto the green cards until you'd finished the purple cards and you, you moved up that way. That's the exact same system we had in science. So what did it mean to be successful back then? You had to give back the right answer. Then there was only one answer. Right. There wasn't sort of variation in the answer. There was an answer and you gave it back and therefore you're successful. You had to do the, all the experiments correctly. 
How many of you came through the Web of Life? You got some biology people here? Some of you do the Web of Life books? Yeah. PSSC Physics, Chem Study. These were programs that were, were done in the 60s and that was part of that race and it was just, those books are stacked full of it. What's really interesting though, <laughs> this is most probably the strongest period we've had in science education for students going into science at the university level. If we have a look at the number of enrollments in science since the 70s, you could ski on it. You could be a downhill skier on it in terms of the slope of people's uh, students coming into, into university going into science careers. So it's interesting that this was back when there was a lot of information transfer, really heavy amounts of content, yet we had more students going into science. I, I, I don't know what that tells us in terms of today's thinking, but it is an interesting thought to see how, that's, how that goes. Importantly, when we start to think about setting a context for where we'd like to go in science, if we go back to the lab report, um, there's a very strong emphasis on us replicating what scientists did or do. I will say did back then because the, the views changed a little bit. But we're all familiar with having to do such lab reports as, you know, the standard typical lab report. But I want to discuss that in a minute where I, I think it's got some changes. And I don't remember too often where students were given an opportunity to change those guidelines about what you had to do. And in fact, you weren't listened to very much if you didn't get the right answer. You actually had to get, the, you had to get somebody else's information to make sure that you had the right answer. So, I mean, it's got labelled as cookbook science and that's really what our exposure was, particularly in the schools. And I would uh, guarantee that most of the people doing Chemistry 101 don't have much say about what goes on uh, at the university level. So if I can fast forward today, to today, I'd like to see if I can frame this uh, and see where we're at, give you some ideas of what I think is, is different. Again, I just mentioned the fact that we've got very few students in terms of real numbers as a percentage going into the sciences. Let me give you in some instance. I was talking, I was at a meeting about uh, 18 months ago, two years ago. Uh, it's a concern about the number of students going into be becoming physics teachers. And I was told by the American Physics Society, who were part of this grant that we were working on, the number of physics teachers graduating across the nation was 70. There were 70 physics teachers graduating that year, that's on average, across the nation. We in Iowa, as a, as a, as a state, graduate somewhere in the order of two to four. So the concept of students going into science is then going into these other science-based areas is, is pretty startling when we start to think about it. So the numbers going in into science-based careers is, is actually decreasing. And part of that, I think, is we've got a whole range of different courses coming up. And there's lots of different options for youth that we, we didn't have back then. I mean, what you can be today, for some of us, you know, back, you know, back a few years, you were very limited. We didn't have biomedical engineering, for example. We didn't have these multiple new emerging disciplines where they're actually going across each other. And, and, and so where that leads to has changed quite remarkably to when it was back in the 60s. You'd be a physicist or a physics teacher. All right. There wasn't such a sudden, some of these disciplines that you've got exposed to now just didn't exist. They've emerged. And I think that changes how we go. Uh, and so I think in today's youth, is, it, it's they just see subjects like physics and chemistry as being extremely difficult. We thought it was difficult back 30 years ago and it's still seen as difficult and I don't know why. It's a perception, therefore they don't go in it because that might affect my GPA. Let me say, as an Australian looking at it, I'm always surprised. We don't have GPAs in, in terms of teaching what I had and I'm always surprised how someone can get more than 100% on a GPA. I just, it, it intrigues me as a, someone looking from outside. But again, we've got areas where people find physics and chemistry, for example, very difficult. They don't go into it. So what are we doing in school that would change that perception? It's something that we have to begin to examine. So these are some issues I think that we need to start to think about as, as we look at science today in school. What do we know about learning theory? Is science really about memory games? Because that's what we've played. We've played this game of we give you something, you give it back to us, therefore you're successful. 
I would uh, urge that I would ask any of you to do all the subjects that you did at undergraduate science. How much do you do you actually remember? Or about five minutes after you've done the test, and on the way to the you know to the place where you get some refreshment, you would then see that as being as long as you'll remember it. And that that's the sense that it's a memory game, and you've played it well. So it comes down to questions about how do we actually replicate the practices of science. What does it mean to replicate those practices and can we actually do them in classrooms? Because we have to get more students to have more success in science than we're currently doing. You only have to look at the push in, in terms of a nation at risk. The whole notion that uh, in the States, in, we're just struggling to get the people coming in to build the, techno the sense of technology that we want to get. The number of, of um, Graduate students, US born graduate students in the science is below 50%. That is, we're not producing our own. So I want to pose the question, if science is about memory games, that tends to say the next generation gets that information from the previous generation. So who gave the first scientists the information? If scientists, current scientists get their information from memory games, who gave the first scientists the information to start doing science? If we have science practice at schools and it's about memory games, then we have to ask the logical question, who started it? Because somebody had to give somebody some of the information if that's how we think science is done. Now I may be overpainting the, the, the case but I've been in a lot of science classrooms and I've seen a lot of it and we tend to have this reliance. We only have to look at, at tests to start to look at that. So if it's not about memory, what is it about? And how do scientists advance concepts? What do they do? So what should our science look like in schools if we're going to line those things up? So if we ask, this is a simple question, we do a lot of research, like some people do a lot of research on it. If we ask students to draw a scientist, what do we get? Guy in a lab coat, frizzy hair, and it's always a guy, it's always a male, all right? Lab coat, out the bench, and, and a frizzy hair, there's some sort of, some nutcase guy at the front, they have this image, and we get it every time. So we have this perception, students, kids have this perception that that science is about some people who have this, you know, sort of nut jobs out the front and it's all frizzy and... I so how do we shift it? So there's a lot of work going on now in science education some, in terms of the sense of thinking about what should it be or what is it. And, and they're really talking about scientists are being involved in two things. They're involved in, in this form of construction. They're constructing new knowledge. But they're also very much involved in critique. And this is what I think is the, is the missing piece. We can get a lot of construction in classrooms, but we don't practice critique. And, and I'll unpack that just a little bit for you. So scientists do these things. This is what we believe they do. They pose questions, they, you know, they gather data, they make claims, and they generate evidence. And they have to test against what is currently known. If they don't test against it, then they're just making it up. Hmm. What's the difference between science and art when we look at tests? If we have to test against what's currently known, in, in art, is this test there? Do we have to come to agreement? One, we could have some argument. I, th I don't think they do as much as we do in scientists. Scientists need to have their claims critiqued. They need to test their claims against each other. They need to test it against nature. They have to come to an agreement. Scientists are looking for universals. They're trying to explain nature by coming up with laws. They have to have that test. I'm not certain we have that in other disciplines. I think they, I think they argue in other disciplines 
but the test against nature is something that other disciplines don't do and that's the difference between those disciplines and science. Now, I put up, I was trying to think of what's a, current, a couple of current instances where this construction and critique wasn't followed. So I'm not certain if some of you remember the cold fusion. Two scientists from Utah raced to get themselves on the evening news and claimed they'd got cold fusion. They got fusion had occurred on the bench, called it cold fusion. They never got their claims critiqued before they went public on them. They didn't get others to have that as a part of a conversation. And there's never been a replication of their experiment, no matter how much money's been thrown at it. So this concept of critique wasn't being applied. Uh, my South Korean colleague, uh, there's an example from South Korea, which was a very famous South Korean scientist who was into cloning, was a world leader in cloning. Uh, didn't like to get his results out there for critique. Even though he had a lot of people coming to see it, he was very famous about it, and they marched him out of his office. So it's, this notion of critique is very important for people from anthropology. I think Margaret Mead was, was there were some discussions about the, the sense of validity of her, her results when they became m more public. So we have in science, we have some cases, very notable cases, where this critique component wasn't applied. And so when we look at doing it in school, we've got to get this sense of critique out there. It has to be front and centre on it. Otherwise, we'll get kids walking away without a sense that what they make up is okay. And we know that's not, the, it, it's okay from an imaginative you know, uh, sense of viewpoint. It's certainly not imaginative in terms of science. So that begs the question, if science do, is about construction and critique, what does science in school look like? How do we get real science into schools? How do we shift from playing memory games to getting into construction and critique? How do we involve students in the process? What do teachers have to do? And this is, I think, some very critical questions which we're really starting to wrestle with now in terms of it. Here's one critical issue that I think is important. Does data equal evidence? Does data equal evidence? This is a big stumbling block. How many times have we seen students write when you see a lab report and they get the results and they go see data under the old lab format? Mm -hmm. See data. All right. Has anybody ever heard data speak? <laughs> All right. I don't think, I, I, I've never heard it, you know. I, I mean, you always listen, but somehow that stuff won't tell you what it's supposed to tell you. All right. And this is a stumbling block when we get into how science is represented, if we have a look at some of the textbooks that are coming out, if we have a look at some of the research, some of the researchers just go down and they put those things together. Data slash evidence, as though they're the same thing. Or we go, people will put out stuff at the moment, which I'm, I, I think, you know, we're starting to debate this as public negotiation, but we hear things like claim, evidence and reasoning. Well, what is evidence if you remove reasoning from it? It's data. So I can't use evidence if I remove reasoning from it as the term. And, and why we say, you know, we say that may be a semantic game, it's actually an incredibly important game. Because this is where we get people to see that in science we, have to, we can get multiple interpretations. For example, in a court case, do we have we have two teams, yet we have one set of data, but we have two sets of evidence. And this is, this is the sorts of examples we need to get kids to play with. The sense that there always comes out to be a set of data. It's not two different sets of data, there's two different interpretations of that data to represent two different cases. He's guilty, Your Honour. No, he's not. It was Mr. Clue and, you know, that sort of stuff that you go. But this, these are really important concepts for kids to get hold of. What does it mean to get evidence? Because when we look at what scientists do, 
that has to come up for public critique. And it's this, it's, it may seem subtle, but it's absolutely critical in getting kids to move forward on, I think, what the practices of science. So can we teach construction and critique using the same old approaches that we've used? And the answer is no. What does it require of teachers? We ha do we have to change what we do in terms of what we teach? If, we, if we've come from information transfer systems, like we did in the 60s, 70s, 80s, we have teachers who have been trained in the 80s and 90s who come from information transfer exposures. You guys want to go teach but you've been given a background of information transfer for a long time. How do you shift from thinking about information transfer, the old stuff where you've got to memorise stuff and give it back, to a process where we start to look at getting kids to have the opportunity to both construct and critique science in the ways in which scientists do. Um, one of the things to think about as, we go, as you go forward, if you look at the old lab report, we do science. All your lab work that you do as undergraduates, as, as secondary students, is we use that lab report format as though we do science that way. Do scientists actually do science using the lab report format? The lab report format is a publication format. That's how they write up their articles to get published. It's not how you do it in the notion, do we set out with a hypothesis? I'm going in with a hypothesis. No, there's a question. I'm playing with the question. I'm, I'm gathering data. I'm, I'm, I'm getting it critiqued. And after I've done all of that, I have to report on it. Now I've got to use the, the scientific method because that's how that's, that, that is a report format. Yet we use that as the driving force of how we should do science in, in, in schools. That's how it's been done. And for me, it's something that we ought to think about, and we do a little bit of research on it. So we've gone through, in terms of science inquiry, we've had a lot of reform documents come up. I don't know if some people saw the paper the other day, but we've just got the next generation science standards have just come out. All right. So we had some back in the 90s, you know, I think it was 97 that it came out. But then before that, we've had some, some uh, it always comes out every 10 or 15 years. We've got kit-based work. FOSS kits, Insight kits, STC. Some of you may have heard about the 5E model. Guided and open inquiry. People keep talking about guided and open inquiry. I must admit that I struggle with that a lot. And here's my struggle. I'm not certain a scientist ever walks into a lab and goes, I don't know what I'm going to do today. I'm just going to play. I mean, the scientist always takes their head in with them and they've always got some direction of where they're going. It's never open. It's never just go and open it up and you know, just see where it goes. So I struggle with the sense of open. That's a semantic argument, but I really struggle with the sense that you say to kids, just go, it's open inquiry. No, they've got something in their head and they want to test what's in their head and they move forward. So I do struggle with this concept. People use it all the time. I just tend to go, call it inquiry. I think we're just going to, we're investigating. It doesn't matter. I, I really don't think we get into openness. So, so again, we've, as I said, we've just started to focus, look, look at the next generation science standard. And if we look at the framing part of that, there's a lot of work on, on kids posing questions, making claims and evidence. They put in explanation. I, I can have another conversation about that. There's also much more focus on big ideas. They're not about facts. They're starting to frame things as big ideas. And if we start to look at learning theory, old learning theory was behavioural stuff. <laughs> you know, we beat the dog, the dog sits, the, you know, no, we don't beat it. We've got signals and we, re and we give it rewards. But it's Pavlovian dog responses, and that's where we've gone. Now we're into cognition. There's been a lot of work on cognitive learning theory. And Cognitive learning theory is about how we store knowledge. It's about, with the, with the behavioural learning system, it's about something done to a student. It's external to the learner. Cognition is focused on something internal to the learner, what's inside people's heads. And so when we talk about that, we're talking about how do we store knowledge. And we store knowledge as 
concepts, as big ideas, and we store them as frameworks of these big ideas. A simple one. Fishing. If I mention the word fishing, you all immediately pull up a whole lot of things that go with it. Boat, rod, bait, tackle. In the state, in Iowa, there's one thing that you'll pull up, pull up as an idea that I won't and my South African resident won't pull up either. You guys will most probably, for those that are keen on fishing, will talk about ice fishing. Right? They, they, no, no, we don't do that in Australia. You never get anything like ice fishing in Australia. It just doesn't exist. All right? I've got a good colleague of mine who thinks it's fantastic to sit and freeze his rear end off for about three or four days with his mates in a, in a little cabin area. And I'm, I, I don't know. That just doesn't seem attractive to me. But the notion is that we store ideas not as facts, but as, as ideas. So you can mention one word and you pull a lot of things with it. Doesn't matter what it is. We can talk football, but I'm not certain a game where nobody kicks it and they throw it should be called football, but that's another conversation that I would enjoy <laughs> having with you. We in Australia kick the ball. So if we then think about that, we have to say, well, if we change from memory games to a learning game, what does that mean for students? What does science now look like? We have to think about students. We have to think about, well, how can we change that for students? So it's more on understanding and not memory. They've got to be able to understand things better, not just cite it back. So as I say, when you go to that watering establishment, you've forgotten it by the time you've actually got to the door. All right? We want you to understand it so it doesn't go away. That requires a lot more active participation. And we really have to understand the role of, uh, of negotiation. And we think that's both a public act and a private act. And I'll, I want to unpack that just a little bit. So at the moment in science education, we have sort of two versions of this idea. We have this stuff that we should learn about argument prior to using it. So we teach kids how to argue. I once had a woman stand up at a conference. It's an international conference. And she goes, she's a, she's a middle-aged woman, I know her, and she stood up and she goes, kids can't argue. And my notion was that woman must be single yeah. without any children. Because <laughs> I don't know <laughs> any parent who who's thinks that children can't argue. She should have most probably better said students to struggle to argue scientifically. <laughs> because I'm not certain all the arguments that come out are rational when it's teenagers arguing. So that's one version of the world. We should teach them how to argue. The other version is we should use argument as the learning tool. And you can maybe guess my version of the world. I think you learn about argument through using argument. So that the learning is done through a scientific argumentation process where there's construction and critique. That's how science should be done. That's my version of the world anyway. So we don't teach argument, we don't teach this construction and critique separate to its use. You learn how to argue through using it. It can't be something done to students. They have to be part of that process. For example, we have a lot of, in some versions of the, in, in the first version of learning how to use it, I often hear the case of people saying, well, they do science and now they do argument. Now, if we look at scientists, I'm not certain they do science and then they think, well, now it's time, I've got to stop doing that, now we'll argue. I think every day they're doing it, they're, they're arguing with each other, with their lab mates, with the, with, in the lab, they're arguing with each other. Doesn't mean they're up there having fist fights. Though we have to be careful of that use of word argument because in different cultures, argument can be literally seen as having a, a, a fight where we tend to use the word negotiation meaning the, similar thing, the same thing. So I've been doing a lot of work and I've got some colleagues here who've been involved in it as well. We use an approach called the science writing heuristic approach, which we're trying to get somewhere where we're replicating this work. So I thought I'd share just a few minutes with you and give you some ideas of how we're seeing this fitting together as a way to how we can look at science in classrooms being different. 
So it's an argument based approach. What we're trying to do is replicate what scientists actually do. It's really based around language. One of the interesting arguments that we've all heard from science teachers is I'm not a teacher of language. That's the English people got to go do that. So here's my question. When someone says that to me, here's my question. I would like you to go and teach a science lesson, but I would like you to remove all forms of language. Text, pictures, diagrams, mathematical equations, chemical equations, symbols. Remove all forms of text. Models, remove all forms of language. Now could you go and teach science please? And I get stunned silence because obviously you can't teach it. So the concept that language is not important is just dumb. You can't teach science without reference to language. And so we think it's got to, we place a lot of emphasis on that. And we really require students to construct science and critique it both publicly and privately. And by private we mean we want them to negotiate with themselves. So when they're writing informally to themselves, when they're reading science books, then they're, they're negotiating with self. We're all the time negotiating with self. As a group, as individuals now, you're all negotiating with this stuff whether you like it or don't like it, whether it's making sense to you, whether I should stop talking, those sorts of things. You're all having a private negotiation. It's not public because we haven't asked you to share those. I don't want the answer, okay? <laughs> so. Uh, so this is, this, this is a student template that, that we put up on the wall as we try to get students to have a think about what should be the structure of science now. This is when they learn bonding. This is when they learn ecosystems. This is, this is how we get kids engaged in learning. So beginning ideas, we really place a lot of emphasis on what are my questions that can be negotiated with the teacher and the students. We really want students to understand how to pose a question. That's very ugly at the start, but by the, by the middle of the year they're getting very good at understanding what are testable questions, what are researchable questions. In the end, what, what we'd like them to, to, be, to do is be involved in, in constructing some tests, understanding what variables are, because they're actually using it and having to do it. Observations, claims, evidence. We like them to test against what uh, other scientists are thinking. And importantly, we really get them to focus on what have, I, have my ideas changed? I thought this at the start, what do I think now? And that's very tough for people to do. We don't sit down and go, look at this reflective process. It, it, it's very difficult. So in terms of negotiation, it becomes really important for what are they. We, we place a lot of emphasis on, we negotiate ideas, we don't negotiate people. We don't have a lot of good role models that kids see on TV and on the radio, for example, about people negotiating with each other. We get people talking past each other, but we don't see debate. We don't see an actual negotiation of an idea. So we, we have to spend time with students to talk about negotiating ideas, not people. Um, and constantly saying, you've got a claim, you've got the evidence, we don't like it, we like it, you've got to expand on it. So we get kids to challenge each other, and that becomes really important. We, we, we focus on the difference between data and evidence. And importantly, one of the things that we, we're not doing in science education that we're starting to do in science education, we're doing a lot of work on trying to understand what are the representational requirements. So when we look at kids putting stuff down on reports, when they write stuff in their notebook, to put stuff down in graphical form, in mathematical equations, etc., are forms of representation. If you ask, if we look at any science concept, any concept, doesn't matter if it's science or not, it has multiple ways in which we can represent it. And every representation generally, I don't want to go to the extreme, but most representations, most concepts need more than one representation. So they're made up of multiple representations are required to fully represent one idea. And we're placing emphasis on that. So what does it mean for a teacher when they have to do that? They can't play memory games. They can't give information transfer. So what do they have to do? 
So we, we focus on setting up non-threatening learning environments. Kids struggle to become part of a negotiation because they're frightened about being wrong. If we shift the fact to say there is no right or wrong answer, then we can shift the environment. Doesn't mean there's not a right answer, it just means we don't advertise that and we start to, we, our role as teachers is to weave how we can get kids to that answer without us telling them everything. Teachers have to be part of the negotiation, they're not separate to it. Their critical role is when to come in, how to be part of that, when to po pose the right question to keep pushing it, to challenge. We focus on big ideas and I, and I like the way the new framework focuses on those concepts of that it's about big ideas. Uh, we have to engage students as learners, not as the receivers of teaching. In our work we don't talk about teaching, we only talk about learning. We don't focus on teaching. So I just thought I'd provide a few results as we get, uh, just as a way to stimulate. We've been doing work, you say, well, you know, we can't do this, we can only do it with older kids. We've had a kindergarten kid walking down the corridor saying he's holding a praying mantis. I have a claim that this is an insect, insect and here's my evidence. We can get young kids to start to think about claims and evidence becoming part of this argument conversation. Not super, it's not really sophisticated, but the language understanding that if I make a claim I have to provide some evidence. Starting to get them to think critically. So we've, we're, we're working from, from the kindergarten, we've actually got done some work in pre-K. We've actually got, there's a college out east that's got, this approach is done in all their undergraduate science, in, sorry, in all their undergraduate chemistry, completely done using this approach. We do chemistry over at uh, Iowa State. Tom Greenbow is doing some really good work in, in freshman chemistry where all of them have to use this approach. Their, their lab reports are based off that student template. We don't use hypothesis or et cetera, it's question claim evidence. So I thought I'd give you a couple of results just to show you that it does work. So we did some work in it. This was a, a, so this was a, a middle school, secondary school. Um, these, these markers represent this. So we took the students and we div divided them up on ITBS scores on high achievers m with middle achievers and low achievers. So we wanted to look at how could we have impact. This is very good people who were good traditional teachers, high achievers, medium ach achievers, low achievers in science and that would reflect traditionally what we'd see. Good SWH teaching, we've closed the gap, just disappears. We change the effect size by about 1.2. We So okay, can it be done at, at the university level? This is organic chemistry. That's done in second year, it's normally sophomore year. Traditionally, kids really struggle with it. Kids who use an SWH approach, this argument based approach, significant differences at the end in, in gains. That's for one year, that was the second year of it. So kids who are being able to use argument as a way they put these ideas together, these are all their exam scores. So this is results on exams. So we're getting carryover from their lab work into their exam work. So we're currently, we've got a project where we managed to get a, a quite a nice size grant. We're doing a randomized field trial which is a very unusual in terms of education. We randomly assign buildings to treatment or control and we're having a look at this as a, as a sort of scientific experiment. So we've got 24, oh, let me go back, we have 24 treatment buildings and 24 control buildings. We've got that spread across the state of Iowa. This is grades 3 through 5. So we're looking at their ITBS test. We've also got what we call the Cornell Critical Thinking Test. It's a test that allows us to see how much they develop in their critical thinking. Because if you're arguing, kids have to reason through all this stuff, you'd expect them to grow in that stuff. So early results show that, that we've got a significant advantage for kids who do argument-based inquiry. They're better at their critical thinking. We get greater growth over a year than, than kids who don't do it. I mean, kids will grow in their critical thinking ability because they mature. What we'd like to do is can we push them to do that faster than if they just threw straight maturity? And the answer is, of one year, yes. And we're currently collecting all that data now. We should know if we get the same results second year or if it gets better and uh, we're hoping it's better. The ITBS test, we had significant gains in science inquiry, subscale score.
and the same we had that carried over into math concepts and estimation and math problem solving and data interpretation which are about critical thinking, reasoning. So at the moment our first year of results on a randomised event, we've done this previously with, small, with a smaller sample and got these results, we've done this on a randomised which allows us to say it's more significant because we didn't, we didn't choose anybody in particular, these are teachers who, wanted, who, who were asked to come, we've got some that do it really well, we've got some that don't want to do it very well, that's just the normal process of moving forward. So what have we learnt as a way of summarising the, the talk? We know that level of implementation is really important. Any new approach, if you don't teach very well, you're not going to get good results. That's, that's pretty straightforward, it's, that's nothing new, but we've got data to show that. One of the things that we have to argue with policy makers is, given the current emphasis on standardised tests, we can actually improve standardised tests by doing something that's different, by getting kids engaged in the process, by having this argument based inquiry, we're actually improving standardised test scores. And importantly, every, every uh, category of student, gender, SES status, IEP and also there, it's uh, English language learners. So every category, that gifted and talented, every subgroup that we did on that ITBS stuff was showing that it's significant advantage to each of those subgroups. So it's not identifying one particular group, it's everybody in that classroom is improving in terms of some of the work here. So we're getting improvement in science uh, students' literacy skills. We'll start to see that. We're doing some analysis. We've got a number of graduate students on that project um, who are doing some really nice analysis of that work. We've got some postdocs that are doing some work on that. So we're able to track that and, and start to put some work out. And we've got some improved critical thinking skills. So if we look back at what science was, science teaching was, to where we want to go, I think we've got some stuff to say we've got a shift and we, we can have this alignment and we're in the process of beginning to understand what that really looks like and you know, we're at the start of that, we've got lots of questions but it's a place in which I think is very exciting as we go forward. The answer would be, we haven't, but what becomes interesting, the answer is no, it's too new at the moment. But uh, we've got a colleague that we're working with over in the UK who's running an interest survey. And he's running it in grade 5, tracking the kids into grade 7, and then tracking kids in grade 9. Because they're, as you know, they're the sorts of decision making years that kids will say they go. So we volunteered to do do that test for them. So we're looking at kids in, in the treatment and control group. These are grade five kids. So we're, we're hoping we can track this a little bit to say, can we get kids in the argument based inquiry approach who then change their interest in science? And I think there's critical questions there. How long do they have to be involved before we can get them to really see this as valuable? How long can we get them involved in terms of getting their critical thinking skills up where they don't want to go back, they understand what that is and that can drive their interest. So I think we're still in those stages of doing that. So the answer is no, but I, it's stuff we'd like to have a look at. Well, one of the parts uh, uh, that I think is always coming about is trying to create a sense of purpose. So when we look at kids who've got English as a second language, or even IEP kids who can struggle with language, we don't have to just go to, lang you know, go to English as a second language. Most of the problem that we have if we play memory games is, is the difficult purpose of attachment to that, why should I do this? And how do I get into it? When we look at negotiation, when we look at sm small group negotiation, in there, they can come into it because it's their question. It's their purpose. So I think what we're able to do is provide some sense of access to these kids that they wouldn't have because A, they can attach to it because it's not my question, it's their question. They can negotiate that in their small group and then they can move forward from that. One of the things, for example, over in Korea that we that struggle with is that kids aren't used to talking in a class. So what they've done over there to change the structure is they go, my question, they get the kids to write down my question, then they go, small group question, 
and then they go whole class question, and they have to negotiate each way along the way. So we're adapting that that particular strategy for some of these places where it's, where it is tougher. But that's the, it is a case we have to get into that. Iowa, unfortunately, uh, doesn't allow us to answer that question very well. Our next grant, we want to get into areas where we can answer that. The antidotal data we get back is really very interesting. I was, well, I was talking with a principal the other day at a small school up north. Um, she's blown away with the fact that kids will talk science at the dinner table. All right? It's a dinner table conversation for, for elementary kids. Now that doesn't normally happen. Kids will do a lot of work on, in terms of their own research at home. So there's, there's a need to want to answer my question. All right? and, and I'm I'm very wary of the word the students are responsible for. In, in the light of, we tend to say, because I've, I'm responsible for giving you, you're responsible for now getting it and doing the things you're supposed to do. And I'm not certain that's how, I, I personally don't think that's how learning is. It's, I think it's, it's, it's because we can negotiate, because we allow them in, into that negotiation, because they're involved in it, they go way beyond where, where we would normally go. I've, had, I've talked to uh, feedback from a superintendent walking into a grade three classroom and cannot believe the language level that these kids are at in terms of their negotiation. So instead of being constrained by boundaries, and it's not a sense of responsibility, it's a, we're all part of this learning process.